Bible series, week number four. Uh, if you remember back at the beginning, we talked about holy fire and how holy fire is a passion. And holy fire is neat because it's engaging. It brings people around you. People like to see stuff burn. It's encouraging. It empowers you. The Holy Spirit, the holy fire of God in you, your passion for things of Christ empowers you. It's contagious. Sort of like that sniffle. It's contagious. If I'm on fire and I hug Hannah, then Hannah's going to be on fire. Right? Fire is contagious. The Holy Spirit working in you is contagious. But we also said it's fragile. It needs to be guarded. It needs to be cared for. It needs to be continually tended and monitored. Then the first week we also talked about what a passion for the lost is. And why we need to have a passion for the lost. Because lost people matter to God. And He wants them found. Then the second week, we talked about a passion for the cross. Who and what the cross represents. It's Jesus. And we talked about his power and his authority. And how his authority is so much greater than just raw power. We talked about the tall football player and the little lady with the zebra suit, right? Power and authority. Then last week, Chip brought an awesome word on the body of Christ. The church and how we it's not just a building church is not the building church is a lifestyle so you don't just go to church you are the church and he challenged us to be the church but I would say I don't think you can be passionate about the lost or the cross or the church if you are not passionate first about what God has called you to be. So this week, we're going to talk about having a passion for who God made you to be. Now, first of all, I don't want any of you to think that I'm starting to espouse some self-help we can do it if we just think good enough. If, if, you, if you are my age, maybe a little older, possibly a little younger, you remember this guy from Saturday Night Live? And remember Stuart Smalley, he said, I'm good enough, and I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. And that made his world just fabulous, right? He was, well, he had bad shows, and he did, but, but anyway, you remember, that's not what we're talking about. Most of us, probably have not looked in the mirror and quoted Stuart Smalley. Okay, two of you. But other than that, not very many people have looked in the mirror and quoted Stuart Smalley. What we hear instead are things like this. You're stupid. You're weak. You're slow. You're ugly. These are lies that are spoken over us, and we end up believing these lies, and they end up being lies that we model in our walk with Christ. But friends, that's what it is. It's a lie. And the lie that is the foundational lie to all of those lies is that you are not enough. How many remember being on the playground and somebody called you a name or said you're stupid or whatever? And what did you say? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Our parents taught us that with good intentions, but it's a lie. I've been hit with sticks, I've been hit with stones. I don't remember those, those hurts, those wounds. But the words that were spoken to me, I remember. I can remember being in second grade. Now, my, the first school I went to, I mean, Cowdersport was a big school for me. When we moved to Cowdersport, it was a big school. Okay, there were 16 kids 
in, my, in, in, in the school that I went to when I was through fourth grade. And in the second grade, I was going to be in charge of a team for kickball at recess. And I was excited. I was so happy because I finally got to be the guy in charge. And I picked my team, and we were doing, I thought, I thought I picked a good team. And my teacher, God bless her, she didn't mean it. But she said, you didn't pick a good team. You don't have any good kids on your team. You're going to lose. There was 16 kids in the class. It's not like I had all kinds of talent to choose from, okay? But apparently I chose the eight ones that were not athletically inclined. But I thought we could win. But I listened to what she said. And you know what? We went out and played kickball. And our little second grade butts got handed to us by a bunch of other second graders who probably weren't any better. But I heard, your team is no good and you're going to lose. And it was a lie, because by fourth grade, same 16 kids, it didn't matter how you picked, one team was always going to crush the other. That's just how it worked. But in my mind, every time I've been given the opportunity to be a leader then, in my life as I've grown, in the back of my mind, I hear Miss Crowell's voice. You didn't pick a good team. Which in my way of hearing said, you're not a good leader. I've been called to be a leader. I've been placed in a leadership position. God has anointed me to be a leader. But I hear that voice of that second grade teacher in my head. Most days. I don't listen to it near as much as I used to. But it's there. It's a lie. Often in life, you and I end up buying into the not enough lie. You're not pretty enough. You're not strong enough. You're not fast enough. You're not smart enough. You're not talented enough. You're not clean enough. You're not dirty enough. Whatever it is, we buy into the not enough lie. And when we buy into that not enough lie, it really affects who we can be in our effective walk with Jesus Christ. Almost all men live from childhood to death behind the semi-opaque curtain, coming out briefly only when forced by some emotional shock and then retreating as quickly as possible into hiding again. The result of this lifelong dissimulation is that people rarely know their neighbors for what they really are, and worse than that, the camouflage is so successful that mostly they do not quite know themselves either. So my challenge today is to maybe shine a little light on who you really are. That is part of who you are is your identity. There are lots and lots and lots of ways to define identity. The one I've chosen is this. Your identity is an honest evaluation of who you were before Christ and how that impacts who you are today while being transformed by Christ into the completed version of who God called you to be in Christ. That's a mouthful. I'm going to say it one more time, just for the people on the live stream. An honest evaluation of who you were before Christ, how that impacts who you are today while being transformed by Christ into the completed version of who God called you to be in Christ. A lot of times we have these wounds that define who we are. And those wounds may heal, but they leave a scar. And we, in turn, try to cover that scar with many different ways. Bravado, Oh, look at my scar. <laughs> Sarcasm. Or piousness. We tend to, as believers, gloss over the wounds and just say, well, the grace of Jesus is just going to cover that. And it does. But you need to heal 
that. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to heal that. Bravado, sarcasm, piousness, none of them heal. They're just makeup. They hide what's underneath, but can be removed rather quickly. Dr. Rob Reamer says, what you believe about yourself is the foundation of your life. It is your identity, and a faulty foundation will create cracks in your soul. I'm going to do a shameless plug right now. Starting Tuesdays in December, we're offering soul care. That's what I meant. January. I am so glad you see people are paying attention. I did that on purpose. Thank you. Both of you. It was, it was like stereo. We're offering soul care. If you think you may have cracks in your foundation, and here's a hint, a little clue, all of us do. I encourage you to come out and participate in this experience and allow the Holy Spirit to begin that healing process. Shameless plug over. Let's go on. So, what should you believe about yourself? Should you believe Stuart Smalley's mantra? I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Are you good enough, smart enough, and really do people like you? Or should we maybe believe something different? Well, the best place to start with anything is at the beginning. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. We're not going to hit every book on the way through. Don't panic. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So all of mankind was created in the image of God. I don't know what that means. I don't know what the image of God is. I've heard some suggest that God, being a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, created us to be body, soul, and spirit. I can't find biblical backup for that, so I don't know if that's accurate or not. I don't know how we are created in God's image, but I know that we are. And because of that, we, individually, are very, very special. Members of the human race are very special. Because unlike any other created being, when God looks at us, he sees himself. I've actually heard people tell me, yeah, 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 mankind is special, but me not so much. Like the species as a whole, yeah, we're all right, but this individual, not so, not so good. So let's individualize this and go to Psalm chapter 139. See, I told you we weren't going to hit them all on the way through. Psalm 139, verse 13 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. How many times have you seen a sandbox in your life? Lots. Who has taken the time to count the grains of sand in the sandbox? That is how much awesome thought process God has towards you. Each time he thinks about you, it's like one of those grains of sand, except his thoughts about you and how much he loves you and how much... He is happy with you and cares about you is greater than that number of grains of sand. That's a lot. I vacuumed a car after a trip to the beach one time, okay? The thoughts about you are a lot. But here the psalmist makes it personal. He says, God, you created my inmost being. Now you guys look at me 
and you see my outer being. Some of you who know me a little better know some of what is inside of me. My family knows more of what's inside of me. My wife knows more about what's inside of me than any other person on the planet. But even the stuff that she doesn't know, Jesus knows. He created my inmost being. Almighty God, creator of the universe, made you. You're special. You are his workmanship. So, can you agree with me that you were handmade individually by Christ to be part of his body? Good. I was hoping you were going to say that. If not, I was going to have to have Chip come back and preach the message from last week and get you all. All right, but we're good. We are all individually made by Christ to be part of his body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 12 to 14 says, Just as a body, although one body has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free. And we were all given to the one spirit, not to, given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. You know what that means? That means our DNA is all the same, but our function is different. So my DNA in Jesus is the same as your DNA in Jesus. But I'm called to be a pastor. You may call, be called to be an electrician. You may be called to be a teacher. Our DNA is the same. But our function is different. If you take the human body, and there's some medical doctors in here, so if I butcher this, I'm sorry. If you take a human body, and you take a cell from an ear, and compare it to a cell from a toe, the DNA is going to be the same. Now, does your ear work the same as your toe? When you're having a hard, gentlemen, when you're having a hard time hearing your wife, does it help to raise your leg? Does that include, does that increase your ability to hear it? No. Yeah, if you raise your leg, you hear about it. There you go. Our DNA is the same, but our functions are different. So the body that Chip preached about last week is made up of parts. Different parts. Unique parts. Individually functioning parts but unified parts. And sometimes, those parts let themselves be known. You wake up in the middle of the night and you need a drink. What part of you wants a drink? Your tongue, your mouth wants a drink. You stumble through the house on your way to the kitchen to get a drink. And you stub your toe. Suddenly, the part that is driving you no longer is your tongue, it's your toe. Because priorities have changed quickly. This is very similar in the body of Christ. Sometimes the hand is what God's going to use. Sometimes it's a foot. Sometimes it's the heart. Sometimes the eye. But just because you are different than your brother or your sister sitting in the aisle with you, in the, in the pew with you this morning, doesn't make you any less a part of the body. You are enough. You and Jesus are enough for whatever he's called you to do. Don't compare yourself. God has put us all in the body. You have a purpose. What is your purpose? To do the part that God has given you to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to keep going, verses 15 to 20. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. 
And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Be careful not to judge other parts of the body from your position in the body. If God has called you to be a pinky toe, don't attempt to tell the eye how to do its job. If you're a heart, you probably don't really know how to digest food. Don't tell the stomach what to do. Are you getting what I'm putting out there? Be exactly what God has called you to be. It's awesome when the body works that way. When the body, when your human body, when parts decide not to work in unity with each other, do you know what that's called? Sickness. Disease. It ends up in death. Not a good place to be. So be careful not to judge other parts of the body from your position in the body. 1 Corinthians 12.21 The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Without the foot, the head can't move. Without my legs, I would be a torso. Without my torso, I'd be a floating head. And I probably wouldn't float very high off the ground. We need each part of the body. God... I'm trying to figure out where I am in my notes. I was going. That's good. Verse 24. Our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Once again, my illustration about stubbing your toe. Suddenly the tongue no longer cared about having a drink because the toe was in an emergency. Right? Very same in the body of Christ, when one of us gets stubbed, the rest of the body should treat it like the emergency it is and care for it. My toe, if I drop something on it, my toe has no way of taking care of itself. It needs my hands to apply the band-aid. It needs my brain to figure out that it's been injured. Right? And, and to tell the hands to apply the band-aid. Very similarly, in the body of Christ, if Chip gets injured, I might not be able to help him. But maybe the Holy Spirit tells me to tell you, because you have a skill set that can help Chip, to assist. That's the body working together. That is individual parts, being individual but being unified. Be excited about what part God has designed for you to play. And be passionate for that part. Encourage each other to be what God wants you to be. JR. Man, when I was in when I was in high school, that, that slogan was all over. Be all you can be. Man, I was oh, oh, oh. I'm gonna be all I can be. And then I enlisted and they told me what I could be, and I said, that's not what I wanted to be. <laughs> but be all you can be. Church, be all you can be. Don't try to be more than what you can be. Be mature in what God has called you to be and do it well. Be all you can be. Verses 27 through 30. I only have 28. Through... Oh, we have it all. all right, praise God. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. 
And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Why would Paul ask these questions? If the answer is anything but no, he would be disproving his own point. There are diverse gifts. Of course there's diverse gifts. Because we are a diverse body. I couldn't handle two of me in a body. Some days I can barely handle one of me in a body. Some days I can't handle one of you in a body, but I get over it and we move on. Paul would have been disproving his own point if the answer to any of those questions was yes. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Verse 11. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And He distributes to each one just as He determines. Jesus made you just like you are. Your gifts are yours. You are not like anyone else in the body. Be original. That's what he wants you to be. When you are, you will be engaging and encouraging and courageous. Because people like authentic people. People don't like fake people. Not very often do you see people striking up a conversation with a mannequin at Kohl's because they're fake people. There's no relationship. Notice I said not very often because you all had a thought. I know you did. Fake people don't build relationship. Authentic people have relationship. Be consumed with holy fire. Love the lost. Embrace the cross. Be the church. And be all you can be. I challenge you to allow the Holy Spirit to rekindle the gift that He's put in you. Allow Jesus to once again fan those embers. Allow the Holy Spirit to be manifest in your life and allow that holy fire to consume you one more time. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Kind Heavenly Father, you are so awesome. Lord, the fact that you think about each of us an infinite number of times. That we are the first thing you think about when we wake up in the morning. Because you're thinking about us all the time. And we're the last thing that you think about before we lay down at night. Because you think about us all the time. Jesus, you have placed in this body here at Calvary's Port Alliance Church a diverse group of people. Lord, that means we're a healthy body. We don't have too many of one and too less of another, but God, you've made us a healthy body and we thank you for that. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would encourage each of us to be who you've made us to be. 
Lord, and to give you the honor and the praise and the glory because the creator of the universe thought enough of us to make us unique and original. We love you. We honor you. And it's in your perfect, matchless name we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen.